Hey folks, it's Carl at WoundsAhealthy.com and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Ask the Expert. Coming at you today from Manhattan and it's great to be in Manhattan and it's always great to visit with my guest. Our guest today is Rick Ritchie. He's uh, going to share some more time with us, which I appreciate you being able to share more time and more information with us. Thank you. Just a little bit of background on Rick. Master's degree in exercise science focus on performance enhancement and injury prevention. He's also a licensed massage therapist. He is a National Academy of Sports Medicine faculty instructor and the owner of this amazing facility here, the Independent Training Spot. Thank you, yeah. In Manhattan, the New York City area, if you need personal training, this is the place to be. Cream of the crop. Thank you. Thank so, you. I appreciate it. Uh, you shared some time with us recently on our uh, one of our earlier episodes, and again, thank you for sharing time yeah. today. Yeah. We have a really cool topic today. We do. Exercise and the brain. Exercise and the brain. So yeah. I'm going to let you run with this and talk okay. to us about this. All right, well, first of all, thank you. And uh, to get started, I'm just going to clean out what started it all. And uh, this is a book called Spark by John Rady. And, uh, He's a, uh, a clinical, uh, he's an associate clinical professor at Harvard. He's been putting a lot of time and effort into helping us understand how exercise helps with the brain. Okay. And so we have a lot of research and a lot of data. I mean, you go all the way back to Kenneth Cooper and aerobics and learning uh, that exercise is good for your heart. And exercise is good for your lungs. And we learn more and more that exercise is good for a whole lot of things. We've not really approached it with exercise in the brain. And there's so many things that we can actually quantify with that. So we can look at the brain and say, uh, we've got some fairly definitive research that helps us understand how exercise helps make us smarter. Um, we have some research that shows how it helps to control things like ADHD and how it helps with, uh, with the alleviating the symptoms of depression and it helps with some people that are going through menopause, and it helps with people that are dealing with uh, with different neurological diseases. So, so exercise in the brain is uh, is becoming one of those things that's opening uh, our eyes more and more to a whole nother aspect of exercise. And I have to be honest that sometimes when I just don't feel like exercising, um, I. I now, instead of thinking, well, I'm supposed to do this, and I need to do this, and it's important, I usually think about my brain, how much work I need to get done, and how much more effective I'll be at that work if I just do my exercise first. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and it generally never guilts me. It convinces me more than anything that I need to go through again, doing my exercise program, get it done, get it over with, and go on about my day and be more effective. That's incredible. Um, so using your brain to decide to help your brain. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. It's funny how that works, right? Yeah, it is cool. Well, uh, you know, I've read, I, I'm no expert in this area at all, but I have read about um, you know, all kinds of benefits to the brain. Uh, more mental clarity yeah. would be one thing. Yeah. Um, being, you know, thinking faster, being more productive. Even from what I understand, the structure of the brain can improve yeah. from exercise. Yeah, well, that's a, that's one of the, the interesting things that has come up recently. Um, there's a, another incredible book, so if you guys get a chance to, to read this book, it's called The Brain That Changes Itself. And uh, it's a great book, and what it does is it starts to really give us the idea and the concept that neuroplasticity exists, which means, uh, I don't know, if you, when, when you were younger, uh, they would say, you know, you're born with all the brain cells you're ever going to have, and they would use that as a scare tactic in high right. school to be like, yeah, don't go out that. drinking, yeah. right? Don't right. go out drinking because yeah. you're gonna kill your brain cells and you have a, you know, a finite number, and once they're dead, they're never coming back. Um, and honestly, up until five, maybe 10 years ago, you'd be like a heretic to say anything that, that spoke towards neuroplasticity. So the brain that changes itself really talks about it, and uh, Dr. Rady talks about it a lot in his book as well, in Spark, and lets us understand that the brain changes itself. Neurons grow, neurons sprout, neurons 
function in unique ways that I find to be really fascinating. So there is a, there is a, a, a chemical in our brain called a BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And uh, the way that he discusses it, he, he gives it a, a wonderful title, he calls it Miracle Growth for the Brain. Okay. He said if you take a neuron, which is the functional unit of the nervous system, right? you put it in a petri dish, and you drop and sprinkle some BDNF on it, it's almost like Wolverine with the claws out, right? It immediately yeah. sprouts new neurons, right. so it creates branches. So that's infrastructure. Okay. That's actually building the infrastructure for more neurons to fire and to wire together. Okay, really. Yeah. So we found that exercise actually elicits BDNF. It produces within the neurons more BDNF so that they can sprout and they can grow. Okay. Uh, so it's a really, really fascinating part of the study that that a few school districts have have learned about mm -hmm. and have taken on and. Uh, and really run with, and one of the school districts he talks about in the book is, a, is the Naperville School District uh, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And they do two different types of PE. They do a zero hour PE, or uh, uh, before school starts, and then they have regular PE. Right. And the zero hour PE, you start your day off with the high intensity exercise, and to be clear, PE is not maybe like my PE that I had, which was let's play Foursquare and let's shoot basketball, or let's just get notes from the doctor and sit on the bleachers. Right? These guys are required to do work. Mm -hmm. So they produce a lot of, they burn a lot of calories in their, in their class. The folks that do the regular PE, reading comprehension boosts 10% across the boards for them. Okay. The people who do the zero hour, which is before school starts, 17% increase wow. in their reading comprehension. Amazing. So we're seeing a turn in people who are doing exercise who are actually getting better grades as opposed to the stereotype of the people who are athletes make worse grades. So we're, we're going to flip the dumb jock and turn it into the smart jock. That's cool because we're the ones that are going through saying, all right, let's push ourselves physically so we become stronger mentally. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 So this is an exciting field of study that's beginning to emerge. And I think this book came out in 2007, 2008. And I just recently heard about it. And I was like, I've got to, I've got to learn a lot more about the information that he's producing here. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So Rick, are there certain exercises that would cause these uh, the, the brain to grow, basically, certain, or would it have anything to do with runner's high that uh -huh. you hear about? Yeah, yeah, so uh, mostly what they do is cardiorespiratory exercise, mm -hmm. uh, and you can do cardiorespiratory exercise in numerous different ways, whether it's continual running or elliptical or, or anything like that, or you can exactly. do it even with the resistance training in circuits, uh, and that would be something the effect um, and you notice that if you've ever run or you've done circuit training and you've gotten pretty high intensity that you do get a runner's high regardless of if you're running or you're on elliptical or steering machine you get this runner's high and uh, they used to say that 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 was um, and, and they still do they, that uh, the endorphins are flowing right, okay, right. so the endorphins um, and we, which is fine but we're not quite sure anymore that endorphins are what's giving you that feeling of of that high. Right. So what they found now is there's a chemical called called endocannabinoids. Right. And uh, endocannabinoids have been termed the brain's marijuana. So it produces its own uh, marijuana. Anyway, the receptors, so when you smoke marijuana, like that, and, and people get high, it's not because your body adapted so that you can take marijuana in, right? Right. It's that marijuana goes to the same receptor sites that the endocannabinoids do. Okay. Strangely, so does chocolate. So you get these oh, people nice. that get like these highs, like this real strong the correlations. Now. Yeah, wow. yeah. So marijuana, chocolate, and exercise. All right. And it gives that feeling of having a high. So and it doesn't happen every time, but it usually has to happen with some fairly high intensity exercise when you push yourself for a run. Can't just go for a light jog and pretend to get that effect. Right, so, right. 
you get that through exercise. So the endocannabinoids, these, uh, the, the body's natural high, uh, are great, and it also helps to produce um, these, these precursors to glutamate, and glutamate is like that number one neurotransmitter in the brain. Right. And so we get things like norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin release, and so these things being released also then lead to glutamate activity, so the firing of the brain a bit more. Um, and so as we do the, the exercises, we get all these wonderful effects. This, the sure. effects of feeling high, yeah. naturally. Right. The effects of, of more activity in the brain, the effects of uh, increased serotonin and, uh, and dopamine. So serotonin is the uh, kind, of, kind of chill out. Right. 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 Dopamine is a pain suppressor. So serotonin is um, basically what the, the Prozac, uh, the, the drug Prozac, uh, takes right. care of, like it simulates for those same receptors, and um, and the dopamine does the Ritalin. So if you if you have people that are on one or the other, because you wouldn't be on both, right. uh, it can only fix one or the other. And that's what's yeah. that's what's interesting is that if there are a lot of things going on chemically in the body, then you may go and get some type of prescription for Ritalin or or Prozac, or, or whatever the generic names of those are. Um, however, they find that with exercise, that exercise tends to give you both of what you need. So if you need more uh, serotonin, or more dopamine, or then it seems to give it to you in a balanced proportion. Now by no right. means am I saying, if you need medication, just go for a run. Yeah. You need to go to your doctor, go to doctor, right? And you need to go uh, and, and see a specialist, However, what's happening now is that more specialists are prescribing exercise rather than just take the pill and go, take the pill and go, take the pill and go. So we're hoping to see more and more um, the, the, the field of psychiatry uh, right. doing a lot more research on exercise and how it positively impacts the brain and the behaviors uh, because of it. So it kind of seems like exercise is medicine Source. Oh my gosh, I haven't been you know, saying that for years. And we have, we have. <laughs> I've been saying this, I say to my clients, um, I'm sure you you know, you have two years. And we've been reading it, it's everywhere, but now this, this data coming out right. is actually showing that this is true. Exercise is medicine. What about the heart? You know, the heart, sure. Exercise is great for you. Uh, you know, lungs, exercise is great for you. Kidneys, exercise is great. Yeah. Now we can add brain to the list? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh. And yet, what still happens in our society so often is that's great that that's good for all of those things, but if you just give me a pill for any one or yeah. every one of those things, yeah. then that's easier. The thing is that these dopamine responses, the more that you do something, so dopamine is the reward center. Mm -hmm. So the more that you do things and you start getting plugged with these little, little nuggets of dopamine, ease into it, ease into your exercise, but you start to create more and more receptors for sure. dopamine. Sure. So now you get more and more receptors for the dopamine that actually makes you start craving exercise a little bit more and a little bit more. So people, you can start up hating exercise and you may even have a genetic predisposition to dislike exercise more than the person sitting next to you. That's fine, but you can build on that. You can actually learn to love it and you can learn to just do it. You know, this could explain why, and, and uh, for those people out there who really know me, um, I have not always been um, a trainer, first of all. I haven't yeah. always been involved in working out and eating healthy like I have been for the past few years. I've had my ups and downs. But it explains on, uh, when I was so on and off for a long time, mm -hmm. how when I would get on, it's like I had to go work out. I had to go to the gym. It's almost like an addiction. But as I started to fall off, it was the, the more I fell off, the easier it became to stay, you know, falling off. Right? Right. And so uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it kind absolutely. of explains some things right there. Yeah. So there's one more thing that I just think is interesting to point out, and is that uh, to follow suit with that, there was a, a, a study done by Duke University in '99 mm -hmm. uh, uh, or 2000, but in uh, October of, of 
2000, the New York Times got hold of the, the study and published it, the study. And the study was about how exercise is as effective and in some ways more effective than the generic drug for Zoloft, and I don't remember the generic name for it, so I apologize for mm -hmm. Zoloft. Um, but the, the generic version of that says exercise is as effective, or in, in many cases more effective, uh, at uh, combating depression wow. than is this drug, which is, which is unbelievable. This is great news, this is incredible, this is something that being heralded all over the place, except that it was, uh, as they point out in the book, that it was, it was hidden on page 14 of the health and wellness section okay. of the New York Times. Oh, okay. And they said if it came in a pill, yeah. you better believe that's front page news. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And it's not in the health and wellness, it is on the front page of the New York Times. So um, I don't think we need to convince people that exercise is good for you, but sometimes even myself, like once I learned all, the, and, and not even close to all, but all the stuff that I have learned about exercise in the brain, mm -hmm. uh, I, I find myself exercising the lot more yeah. because I want my brain to, to function at a level I need it to function and to either you know run the, the, the facility here on, uh, sure. uh, uh, in Manhattan or to teach workshops you know to do the exercise science education yeah. stuff that I do and I feel like look if I get a workout in then maybe it'll help me remember more of what I need to remember in order to, to teach better to do better to know better uh, to relate content better yeah that, that makes sense Thank you. We are learning that different sections of the brain actually learn better or produce more of that BDNF, so the brain derived right. neurotrophic factor, okay. miracle growth for the brain. Uh, we find that doing certain exercises affects certain uh, parts of the brain. So the, um, the cerebellum, which is responsible for more coordinated movements and, and uh, functioning, we we found that the uh, that exercises that would have more to do with coordination, like uh, like maybe jujitsu, right? So wrestling or dance, choreography. So learning new things with your movement patterns actually develops more BDNF in the cerebellum. Oh, right? okay. So the hippocampus, which is great for long-term potentiation, so long-term uh, memory. Um, doing general exercises like going out for a run, things like that, that's where you'll see uh, larger concentrations of BDNF in that portion of the brain. So again, that higher concentrations of BDNF in the hippocampus is going to help us to remember long-term things. Okay. And so let's not just learn something new, but let's learn it for uh, a long, long time. Term. So let's take it and transfer it into the hippocampus. Um, I guess the, the last portion of it should may have been the first. It's called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex we find exercise and not coordinated or anything like that. But just the prefrontal cortex also increases EDNF and that allows us to learn new things. Okay. So the, the prefrontal cortex following exercise, we found that people can learn new languages faster. So they learn vocabulary words faster. And that's all the new stuff portion of the brain. Once the prefrontal cortex gets that new stuff in and it starts to learn it, it's actually shifting it over to the hippocampus and other parts of the brain to store that for long-term potentiation. So the prefrontal cortex will kind of take that stuff, the new stuff, uh, which we can learn better after higher intensity bouts of exercise. Uh, and when I say higher intensity, it's generally still about anaerobic threshold. It's not you know, completely crazy, just run and bang your head into things and kind of work out, but, but a, a very planned out, like high intensity cardio respiratory activity. Uh, and you see things like that starting to take place in the brain. So it's fascinating, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I encourage you again, the guys, to, to look more into this book. You too, Carl, you get a chance yeah. to read Spark by Dr. John Lee. And the book is called The Brain That Changes Itself. The Brain That Changes Itself. Yeah, I'll probably get my hands on that. Yeah, that one's a good one. Well. Yeah, and that one's great. Uh, it deals more with neuroplasticity. Uh -huh. uh, and this one is a, uh, basically it's a hundred percent exercise, check and out. all the numerous things that that exercise helps the brain to do, and how it helps the brain to function. That's great. Yeah. So, well, I just learned a whole bunch. 
Yeah. 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 I hope you did too. This is fascinating stuff. Um, so thank you again. Thank you again thank for uh, you. sharing with us, for being on our program again. Um, appreciate having you here. Remember, if you're in the New York City area, the independent training spot is the place to be. Yeah. 28th and 5th, Midtown Manhattan. Come over and check us out. It's a great place. So, Poonsahealthy.com, independenttrainingspot.com. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you again. Have a great day, folks.